much for that. We really appreciate it. So again, uh, a very genuine thank you for joining us tonight. I want to thank uh, Vitamart and New Roots Herbal for the opportunity to reach you this evening. This is a topic near and dear to my heart. I've had the privilege of practicing naturopathic medicine for about 15 years now. And principally, the people I treat are coming for issues in the world of natural uh, management of mental health. Hello, turn that on. Let me lower that. Okay. So just doing a little prep here and we will be off and running momentarily. Okay, so again, a big thank you to both Vitamart and New Roots for the uh, platform to reach you with this evening. Um, no further delay, I'll dive right into it, and I assume people are interested in the topic. Please feel free to type questions into the chat box as we go, but I think what we're gonna do is people are likely often on a timeline. Uh, type them as we go, but I think I'm gonna wait till the end of the presentation to answer questions and I'll happily stick around for as long as people require to answer any and all questions that you have that's no problem at all so the questions box will be how we go about doing that all right so briefly about myself and my wife we're both naturopaths we practice in Bolton Ontario a little suburb of Toronto my, uh, my wife principally works in the world of advanced cancer I very much admire her for that it's a very tough area to work in I principally work in the world of mental health as I said but we certainly see people from all areas, but very much mental health is certainly my personal focus. I teach the second year curriculum in clinical nutrition at the College of Naturopathic Medicine. I've had the privilege of delivering that course for the last 15 years. It shocks me sometimes how, how long it's been. Uh, I am confident we're gonna send you home today with some useful information. I have to start with just a few images. Our office is a little century home on the main strip of Bolton, and I'm a very avid gardener, so we've turned the yard of the home into what I call an urban farm. The flower in the foreground here is hibiscus. It emerges a very important medicine uh, for blood pressure, also for glucose control and cholesterol. It's the logo of our clinic, so we always keep one around. My wife there is showing off the tomato plants, there is our urban farm, I like to call it, in the spring. Uh, you can see the sort of drip irrigation system. The next picture is the same image two months later. We have a very short growing season, season in southern Ontario, but a very good one. Um, what do I have next? These are the pots that we like to grow. There's the hibiscus again. And I can't give a presentation without showing off these little angels. That's my daughter, Sophia, and my son, Nathaniel. So with that done, off we go. Uh, to the topic at hand. So I teach second year nutrition at the College of Naturopathic Medicine. Jonathan Prowski teaches the third year nutrition curriculum and he really got me motivated when I was a student about the notion of using natural medicine in the world of mental health. He's very well published in it. I would say he was North America's first naturopath to really really focus in the world of psychiatry and I owe him a huge debt of gratitude because he got me very excited about working in this specific area. So now 15 years of practice, um, my first four years I was focused more on what we call metabolic syndrome, which is diabetes, cholesterol, blood pressure. So this is how did I get to treat mental health and differentiate between diet and lifestyle versus some natural health products. Uh, we'll get there shortly. So I'm working in the world of metabolic syndrome, mostly diabetes, and my patients with diabetes or cholesterol would start telling me this. You know, I showed up and I told you about, about diabetes. I never told you that I was diagnosed with and I've been suffering major depression for a couple of years. I've been doing your strategies for about six months, and I have to tell you that I really feel incredible. For the first time in my life, I realized how depressed I am, um, and this has really helped depression. So that really got me motivated. I'm like, hey, I've got these great strategies for, for mental health. This is diet and lifestyle focused, exercise, weight loss, really basic supplements, and people are telling me that it really helps their mood. So I went around and giving talks like I'm giving today, um, very early in my career, focusing on diet, lifestyle. We'll certainly talk about some of that today. And then an odd thing happened. The very first two people that entered my private practice with a principal concern related to mental health were the cleanest living elite athletes I had ever met in my life. And I sat back and said, oh, uh, weight loss is not really an important focus for you, nor is changing your diet. You're eating fantastic. And I quickly realized that I'm a huge advocate of changes to diet and lifestyle. If you come to our office with diabetes or cholesterol or blood pressure, 85, 90% of our advice to you is going to be about diet and lifestyle. 
In the world of mental health, that changes. Diet and lifestyle are still important, but by the nature of the problem, a lot of emphasis does end up being on some natural health product options. So forest for the trees, you, you come with a principal concern related in the world of mental health. If metabolic syndrome is present, if you also have diabetes, well, weight loss, exercise are going to be really important parts of that treatment and yes, some supplements that help mental health. If autoimmune disease, if you have chronic pain, well, of course, mood will be low, you may have anxiety. To address autoimmune disease, and we can happily redo one of these webinars focused on this as the topic, that is, again, principally focused on diet change. Um, and yeah, we'll throw in some natural health products to help mental health. This is somewhat controversial. I've been at this a lot of years. This is not a discussion point. This truly is a statement of fact vegan, vegetarian, or diet very low in animal protein, you do this long enough inappropriately, and sadly a lot of young people do do it very inappropriately, it really leads to significant mental health issues. So when we see people that are vegan or vegetarian, they need a protein supplement, they need a B12 supplement desperately, and they usually, not always, need iron, and then maybe some extra things that help uh, that help mental health. And if diet and lifestyle appear acceptable, there's nothing glaringly wrong in that area. We focus on the natural health products. The availability of counseling is a really big uh, perk and makes the process much easier. So I'm gonna present a series of papers that really bring into question um, the safety and usefulness of prescriptions in the world of mental health. I certainly have lots of patients that take these medications, lots of patients that absolutely need them. But like most prescriptions this day and age, they are simply grossly overprescribed and people aren't warned about the potential harms. And that's really inappropriate. There's a legal obligation of the prescriber to inform people of potential harms, um, potential addictiveness, et cetera. And I find in the world of mental health that's largely being ignored. So I'm certainly not trying to ridicule anyone who's taking these medications. I work with such people every single day. I'm just trying to create some awareness about some of the harm that can be associated with them. This is a massive study. It's out of Harvard. They followed, it's actually over 150,000 women. You'll see why the number is different. But they followed a lot of women for six years and they asked a simple question, do you take an antidepressant, yes or no? And if you do, what is your risk of death? This is the hardest number in medicine to move, also the most important, all cause death. Very few natural medicines, very few prescription medicines have ever been shown to lower all cause death. If you survived a heart attack, fish oil lowers all cause death. If you have heart failure, Coenzyme Q10 lowers all cause death. If you've got a heart attack, a beta blocker lowers all cause death. Lovely. What do antidepressants do to all cause death? If you took the newer generation antidepressant for six years, it predicted a 45% increased risk of death. This is a huge number, very alarming. If you took the older generation antidepressant, it predicted a 67% increased risk of death. Even more alarming. This increased risk of death was principally due to a 112% increased risk of fatal hemorrhagic stroke. That is really, really horrifying stuff. Now, as unpleasant as that is, that is an understatement of harm. Why did we say that? If you were taking the antidepressant when the study started, you weren't included. So remember I said the actual number was over 150,000 women? About 15,000 women were taking it when the study started, so they weren't included. Imagine what the increased risk of death would be if you included the people that had been taking it for an even longer period of time. So that's why we call it an underestimate of harm. Now this is the part, it's gonna become very important over the next few slides. The paper is saying we are prescribing five times more of them than we were 20 years ago, and that this increase is not due to severe depression. The prevalence of severe depression is not increasing. What's increasing is that we're prescribing more and more and more of these for mild to moderate depression. And that's gonna become very interesting very shortly. 
So that's study number one. Study number two is in the Journal of the American Medical Association, very famous journal. Um, this journal is famous for hating everything natural, but that's besides the point. So this paper didn't ask the question, do they, are they harmful? This, this paper asked the question, do they work? So they took every study in existence that's ever been done on an antidepressant and said, does it work? Yes or no? They mathematically combined them like it was one big study. And they said, no doubt for very severe depression, they are helpful. For mild to moderate depression, they are no different than placebo. Whoa. We're prescribing five times more of them, and that increase is for mild to moderate depression. But for mild to moderate depression, the Journal of the American Medical Association is telling us they don't work. You can see we've got an issue here. This last paper is a little more, is a little less powerful, but it's still very interesting in what it tells us. They took one very specific antidepressant, and they said, we're going to take every study the drug company submitted to the FDA. We think they overstate the benefit. We think they, they write up the study in a way that's really not accurate. We're going to do our own analysis of the data, and we are going to decide how effective these things actually are. So they said of this specific drug, 4,000 people taking the drug for one year. After one year of 4,000 people, 108 were in remission and had not dropped out. 108 of 4,001. That is a success rate of 3.2%. So I start this talk, it's, yeah, it's not a good thing. We have a problem here. Naturopaths love the word integrative. It's not by accident that when talking about these prescriptions, I've chosen to use the word alternative. Alternatives are a necessity here. If I told you, oh, you're depressed here, I have this solution for you. The likelihood of it working after a year is 3.2% and it increases risk of all cause death. How many people would sign up for this? I don't think very many. We present it as it works great with few side effects, but that's not really the reality. Alternatives and necessity, and that's what we're here to talk about today. These are the medications in question. They're all very common practicing in this area. I, there isn't a drug on this list we haven't worked with. They're all extremely common. I'd say the most common are these two classes here, which are the SSRI, and the SNRI. The rest are a little less common, but still quite quite available. This is the older generation. You don't see these very often anymore. Usually these are being taken by older people who were prescribed them 30, 40 years ago. Nowadays, this would very, very rarely be used as a first line prescription. So that's the antidepressant. This is now the antipsychotic class. We talk a little bit about it, not too, too much. This is more for schizophrenia and bipolar. As aggressive as the antidepressants are, these are even stronger. Um, please don't shoot the messenger. But as the presentation goes on, I'm going to show you a study where they administer the antipsychotic class of drug to three-year-old children. Um, it's coming. Maybe give me 20 minutes, half an hour, and we'll be there. Okay. Um, so that's a bit about what the drugs are. So there's three main classes, the antidepressant, the antipsychotic, and the benzodiazepine. These are the PAMs, loratapam, Advan, lorazepam, clonazepam. Um, these are very fast acting, typically used for like panic attacks. Usually they're used as needed. So some people will take these every day ongoing, but um, most people will take these as needed. All right. So moving on, we got to talk about this. So why aren't I just focusing on depression? There's a big fancy word called comorbidity. It, it basically means bad things that happen together. If people have heard of metabolic syndrome, which is diabetes plus cholesterol plus blood pressure, that is a comorbidity, bad things happening together. In the world of mental health, this is the very common comorbidity. Depression plus anxiety plus insomnia. Your main concern may be anxiety, but if I keep questioning you, we will find some depression. We will find you have some sleep issues. If your main issue is depression, 
and we keep questioning you, you're not quite sleeping right and you're a little bit anxious. So the three of these happen together. So as we talk about treatment, um, we're really simultaneously addressing all three of these areas. A repeat of a slide we saw earlier. We're not going to forget about diet and lifestyle. Um, if a person's overweight, obese, has diabetes, we have to address that. That's going to have direct impact on mental health. If they have chronic pain, autoimmune disease, bowel disease, asthma, that's directly going to impact mental health. We have to address that. Vegan vegetarianism, it's easy to address. They need protein, they need B12, they often need iron. Do that and you'd be shocked how much better vegans and vegetarians feel. Counseling, very, very important. So diet and lifestyle, certainly important anytime you visit an ND for any sort of problem. Exercise, powerful contributor to the ability of diet and lifestyle to help mood and behavior. We're not trying to turn people into Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is so important. I give many talks where we actually compare what is the difference in benefit between really extreme, like intense exercise versus just going for a walk. And the difference is almost zero. The going for the walk versus doing nothing is where you get all the benefit. We want people to go for a walk at 60 to 70% of max heart rate. There's a calculation, max heart rate is 220 minus age. I'm doing a calculation for a 40 year old, 220 minus 40 is 180. 60% of 180 is 108 beats per minute. 70% of 180 is 126. So what does this feel like? This is a walk. I mean, you're moving, you might sweat a bit over time, but you're able to speak comfortably while you do it. That's all we need and it's life changing for people. This, each of these is a human intervention trial using exercise versus no exercise as treatment for people with depression, with bipolar, even with schizophrenia, and it shows you get people with a mental health diagnosis to consistently exercise and they feel a lot better. I don't think anyone is or should be surprised about that, right? Right. Um, we'll skip this one, even old school knew that exercise really helps mental health. These next three slides, I get excited about this, right? Okay, I'm overweight, I've been exercising, but I'm not losing any weight. I get demotivated and I stop exercising. Don't. The purpose of these three slides is to show that exercise in the absence of weight loss still achieves really profound positive benefit. So this schematic is all the different positive things that exercise does. And we're zeroing in on this one, systemic inflammation. If I gather up otherwise healthy people, and compare them to people with a mental health diagnosis, the people with the mental health diagnosis have elevated markers of circulating inflammation. Same is true for all chronic disease. If you have dementia and I line up healthy people without dementia and measure, the people with the diagnosis will have elevated circulating markers of inflammation. It's true for all chronic illness pretty much across the board. So, Exercise improves inflammation. How? You have fat under your skin. That's, that's subcutaneous fat. That's not what we're talking about. Then you have fat around your organs, and that is visceral fat. Visceral fat is very hormonally active. Each one of these is produced by visceral fat. It is a hormone organ, the fat around your organs. And every single one of these molecules it's spitting out into circulation is a driver of inflammation. If we can shrink visceral fat, we reduce inflammation. Well, don't I have to lose weight to shrink this? No. This is cross-section MRI of the abdomen showing visceral fat. They made these people exercise for a period of eight or 10 weeks but didn't let them lose any weight. This was such a tightly controlled trial. It was done in a metabolic bubble, perfectly calculated caloric expenditure, took into account the exercise, refed people the exact amount of calories so that they would perfectly maintain weight even though they exercised. After that 10 weeks, they redid the MRI. And you can see that even in the absence of weight loss, exercise shrinks the visceral fat compartment and thus shrinks circulating levels of inflammation 
direct, direct, very significant benefit in the world of mental health. Okay, diet and lifestyle important, counseling really good. If you're vegan, vegetarian, you need protein and B12 and you probably need iron. And now we focus on mental health, natural health products focused on mental health that are gonna give us some good outcomes. Um, this is my little schematic to say, as an ND, I've been taught over a thousand herbs and over 500 nutritional agents. It's 1,500 tools in the tool bag. How are we gonna pick which tools to use? We want them to have lots of science of safety and efficacy. If it has lots of science that it works, but I know that it can be potentially unsafe, why bother use it? I've got 15 other potential tools. If I know for sure it's safe and I think it might work, well, I'll give it a try. But when I know for sure it's safe and it's got lots of evidence that says it works, this is what I want to focus on. Of the 1,500, how many am I going to be left with? I want to play in this zone over here, right? Okay. So this is my summary slide. We're going to repeat it when the talk ends, okay? So that it's there as a summary and we all remember what we were focusing in on. Um, we start with first line and we're going to differentiate what is safe and what is not to safe to combine with prescriptions. So these first three, 100% safe to combine with any prescription in the world of mental health. I would not say that on a public webinar if there was any safety concern. Number one is very high EPA fish oil. There's two active ingredients in fish oil, EPA and DHA. We're gonna talk more about each of these in quite a bit of detail. That's what the rest of the webinar is gonna be. Very high EPA fish oil. Number two, vitamin D. Number three, a multivitamin that is free from vitamin A and beta carotene. We never supplement a human being with vitamin A or beta carotene or simply a B complex. What you're after is like a B50, a one a day B complex or a multi that gives you good Bs. That's gonna work miracles. The other thing we include, cause very commonly insomnia is an issue in mental health is melatonin. All three of these things and melatonin can be combined with any prescription in the world of mental health very, very safely without hesitation. Above and beyond these, but not for people on a medication, we're also very strongly gonna consider lavender oil. We're very, gonna very strongly consider St. John's wort. Um, we're also, sorry about that delay. We're also gonna talk today about CAVA. We're also gonna talk today about NAC, which is in this third line level here. So that's really the way we approach issues in mental health. Um, step one is a no brainer, high EPA fish oil, vitamin D, B complex, melatonin if sleep is an issue. Beyond that, we will look into lavender, cava, N-acetylcysteine, St. John's work. So let's dive into some of these. Okay, fish oil I'm gonna spend the longest amount of time on, the rest will go through pretty quickly. I love fish oil, I did my master's degree in fish oil. I could talk about fish oil for 24 hours. So I love this little, this is my joke here. Fish oil is antidepressant. You give a specific type of drug for that. Fish oil is also antipsychotic and mood stabilizing. You give a completely different drug for that. Fish oil does all three of those, that's awesome. Fish oil has side effects. You ready for the side effects? It reduces your risk of sudden coronary death. It reduces your risk of non-fatal major heart problems. It reduces harmful triglyceride by a very large amount. It increases beneficial HDL cholesterol. If you have chronic pain and you're taking pain medication, it reduces your requirement for pain medication by 50%. How awesome is that? There is a true side effect of fish oil. It may give you a fishy burp. Given that it does all of these things, my patients complain about the fishy burp and I say, sorry, deal with the fishy burp. Like these are some really, really powerful outcomes, right? EPA and DHA are the active ingredients. Whether you're talking about adult mental health or childhood ADD, I can't stress this enough. Most of the fish oils marketed towards kids have more DHA than EPA and that is outright a mistake. It must be high EPA in all of these settings. So, so, so important. 
The dose is a thousand milligrams of EPA for adults. More is not better. This is the number you want to hit, thousand milligrams of EPA. We don't mind DHA. DHA is not bad, but we always want much more EPA than DHA. For kids, the EPA dose is five to 600 milligrams. Again, we don't mind the DHA, but there must always be more EPA than DHA. Always take fish oil. Frankly, always take all supplements with food. It nearly doubles their absorption. I love this one. My patients, psychiatrists, will often tell my patient, that's useless, that's not going to do anything. Well, the psychiatrist should read the position statement of their own association. The American Psychiatric Association, since 2006, has been saying, and I quote, all adults should eat fish, great. If you have mood, impulse control, or psychotic disorders, you should be supplementing at least a gram of fish oil a day. And I say that's 1,000 milligrams of specifically EPA. That was my recommendation. Up to three grams a day is safe. Greater than three grams a day, you should be monitored by a physician. We're saying you only need a gram a day. All patients with mood, impulse control, or psychotic disorders should be taking fish oil. Right? My job is easy. We call this the hockey scores. If the oil is high EPA, there's been 20 studies done, 18 of them say it's positive. If the oil has more EPA than DHA, but only by a little bit, there's been 13 studies total, seven of them are positive. We're starting to slip a little. If the oil has more DHA than EPA, 13 studies, only two of them positive. High DHA fish oil does not help mood and behavior. It must be high EPA. This is my single favorite study. We took people with a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. Group one got high EPA, one gram. Group two got Prozac. Group three got both. The fish oil by itself worked a little bit better than the Prozac and both combined worked better than either one alone. You're unmedicated, you're depressed, take some high EPA fish oil. You're on a medication, the medication helped, but you still feel down, add high EPA fish oil to the medication. It's gonna make your medication work better, right? I love that study. This is showing it also helps mood in bipolar. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on that, lovely. This one we're gonna spend some time on. I warned you it was coming, I apologize in advance. This is Joseph Biederman, he is the director, very fancy title, of Pediatric Neuropsychopharmacology at Harvard. He invented the diagnosis of pediatric bipolar. Then he did a study where he gave not antidepressants, but antipsychotics to three-year-old children for bipolar. Please pay attention to these numbers. He said, if we improve, this is called the Young Mania Rating Scale. So we're no longer talking about depression, we're talking about mania, which is a very dangerous symptom. And these kids are manic. He gives the drug and he says, if we reduce mania by 30%, that's good. 53% of kids on olanzapine, 69% on risperidone, lowered mania by 30%. Please remember that 30% number. So it was about half, a little better. 55% of kids got a 30% reduction in mania. Okay, well, his buddy down the hall, excuse me, did the first ever human study of fish oil for adult bipolar. So his buddy said, hey, why don't you try fish oil for these kids, right? So here we go. Same guy. Still elevated young mania rating scale. We're trying to reduce mania, right? And what am I highlighting here? To improve mood, we already showed you that. That's fish oil as an antidepressant. Now we're showing you fish oil as a mood stabilizer. This is fish oil now acting as an antipsychotic class of drug. And it does it. So here we go. We give the fish oil. 50% of kids, high EPA, very high EPA. 50% of kids got a 30% reduction in mania. 
over a third of kids got a 50% reduction in mania. Wow. If your child has pediatric bipolar, wouldn't you try this first rather than a fairly invasive antipsychotic drug? And this is where we become a conspiracy theorist. If you read the whole study, it's very positive. Manic symptoms can be rapidly reduced in youths with bipolar, with a safe and well-tolerated. He made it sound very good if you read the whole study. If you only read the abstract, he made it seem like it didn't work. As only a third of kids got a 50% reduction in mania, the fish oil was okay. Well, hold on. When he did the drug study, how much was he trying to reduce mania by? 30 percent people catch that right very bad and i'm not the only one to showcase this a very powerful book i encourage people to get it uh former editor-in-chief of the new england journal of medicine this is like the sun shines on this journal she's out of harvard wrote up she she resigned and wrote this book truth about drug companies how they deceive us yes she's a whole chapter devoted to the gentleman i was just talking about so it's out there, hey, fish oil really helps mental health, but interests would rather us use prescriptions. That's fine. And then fish oil helps mood. Fish oil is mood stabilizing. That's mania. And this is fish oil as an antipsychotic. We're using it in schizophrenia. Yes, we saw some symptom benefit, but I really want to showcase this to you. There's a method where we can measure things in your brain without physically going into your brain. It's basically an MRI that lets you quantify stuff. There's five grams of this in your brain. If you do this to people with schizophrenia, left hemisphere glutamine and glutamate are off. We know that if you give a prescription drug in schizophrenia, when the drug works, it corrects this. Every single patient, patient we gave EPA to, the glutamine-glutamate ratio was corrected. That's awesome. So fish oil improves mood. Fish oil stabilizes mood in bipolar. And fish oil is antipsychotic. That's awesome. I throw this in. It's not our topic today, but this is fish oil for ADD. Has to be high EPA. This is a nine-year-old boy with ADD. Uh, they asked this boy to do some writing. Uh, you can't read it, right? It's illegible. The only thing they gave this boy was high EPA fish oil for at least three months. It takes at least three months to kick in. Here's the post. Isn't that awesome? Fish oil and your brain. I keep a picture of this in my office and I show it to people. All right. So that's fish oil. Now we get into some other stuff. Here's a multi or a B complex. Told you they're very important, they really are. These first two studies are really simple. They gave it to otherwise healthy people just to see what happened. I'm not saying you give a multi, you're gonna cure cancer and you're not gonna cure heart disease, but guess what? You give a multi, people say they feel better. They have a better sense of well being. They say their mood is better. Depression scores improve, anxiety scores improve. Okay, it's not a miracle cure for people with mental health issues, but I want to take advantage of this when I'm working in the world of mental health. You take a multi, you feel better. Okay, this is more important. Homocysteine is a very nasty little molecule that floats around our blood. It causes blood vessels to constrict. So it essentially restricts blood flow to your brain. Very, very powerful links between elevated homocysteine and depression. Folic acid and B12, as found in any good multi, the amount of folic acid and B12 in any reasonable multi powerfully lowers homocysteine. So then you have these links. My favorite is just the homocysteine hypothesis of depression, that by limiting blood flow to the brain, homocysteine is a direct cause of mental illness. And that simple B12 and folic acid, why did I harp on vegan and vegetarianism? Because unless you're supplementing, you are always B12 deficient as a vegan or vegetarian. It's a statement of fact. So you then have elevated homocysteine, which contributes to mental health issues. Multi or B complex corrects the homocysteine. And that's the multi and the B. Vitamin D. 
If I round, round up people with a mental health diagnosis, compare them to otherwise healthy controls, the people with the mental health diagnosis have lower levels of vitamin D. That alone does not convince you to supplement it. Based on that, we then did the proper randomized placebo-controlled trials. Everybody has depression, half of you get placebo, half of you get vitamin D, what happens, right? And I'm just giving you a list of dozens of these. There's The next five slides are just studies that did this. This one's awesome. Everyone in the study was taking Prozac. Everyone's on Prozac, then half the people get vitamin D, the other half get placebo. You add vitamin D to a prescription antidepressant, people feel better. If you're not on an antidepressant and you have depression, we give you vitamin D, you feel better. More of the same, more of the same. I think we get the idea in total. There's probably 15 to 20 human studies that have shown vitamin D helps mood. Okay. We love our melatonin. It's super cheap. It's non-habit forming. It's the safest substance in the planet. We administer to kids. We administer to the elderly. As of 2009, there were 90 human studies of using melatonin for sleep. There's now well over 150. Of the 150, over 50 of them are using it in young kids. You're not going to hurt anybody with vitamin D. The issue is the dosing. The dosing is very unique. So what, what we tell people is, um, is simple. Okay, we start adults with three milligrams, boom, and we tell them. Usually this works. You take it a half hour before bed. It works the day you take it. You'll sleep like a baby. You'll wake up thinking we were a genius to give it to you. Love it. Some people, they take it, and they think it did absolutely nothing. That was useless. It did nothing. If that happens, that means three milligrams wasn't enough. Next day, take six milligrams. If it still didn't work, next day, take nine to a max of 15 milligrams a day. Okay, there you go. Play with it till you find your dose. Some people will take three milligrams and they won't like it. They'll get side effects. The most common side effect is you take it, you sleep like a baby, but then you wake up groggy right? And the grogginess lasts like 20 minutes and you snap out of it, but you don't like that. Another side effect, it's less common, but it can give you really vivid, vivid dreams. Like you're in a video game or even nightmares. That's rare. Don't be alarmed. So what we tell people is if you take it and any of the side effects occur, don't be alarmed. Next day, don't take three milligrams, cut it in half, take 1.5. If that happens again, vivid dreams, nightmares, or grogginess the next day, um, don't cut it in half, cut it into quarters. So some people are going to take tiny little doses. Some people will take much more. Either way, play with it, figure out the individual dose, and it works remarkably well. It's very, very safe. Long, long-term human studies give 20 milligrams per day, every day, for life, to people with advanced cancer. And it's very helpful, it prolongs life, it reduces side effects of chemotherapy radiation, it improves quality of life. It's the number one thing we give people with advanced cancer. So that's melatonin. Lavender, we should not be combining this with drugs. So everything we mentioned so far, safe to add to a drug. Everything else we're going to talk about, if you're on a prescription, you really should consult with a naturopath before you add it to a drug, okay? Including lavender. So it's 80 milligrams, tiny little pill, very cost effective. It costs 50, 60 cents a day, very cost effective. Um, huge, huge outcomes, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, something that's horribly difficult to treat. Lavender has shown important benefit there. Uh, chronic fatigue, that's the fancy way of saying chronic fatigue, also very difficult to treat. Similar effectiveness to antidepressants, actually slightly better. Equal benefit as benzodiazepine. This is my favorite study. It's the biggest one ever done on lavender. Group one gets lavender one a day. Group two gets lavender two per day. Group three gets the prescription antidepressant Paxil. And group four gets placebo. Lavender one per day works better than 
Paxil. Lavender two per day works better than lavender one per day. So we usually have people start on lavender one per day. And if eight weeks in, we don't like how it's going, we will bump it up at that point to two per day. Lavender is awesome stuff. I'm going to skip inositol. There's not much to be discussed about it. It's kind of brain food. It's really good for you. I much prefer to talk about inositol when we talk about women's health, fertility, polycystic ovary syndrome. And I love talking about inositol for diabetes. It's claimed it can be used in the world of mental health, but it's more secondary. St. John's wort has great evidence, but this does not play well with drugs. If you're on a prescription, do not use St. John's wort, okay? If you're not on a prescription, ultra effective. Cochrane is the end all and be all. If Cochrane says something works, it does. Cochrane says compared to antidepressants, okay, St. John's wort is superior to placebo, similarly effective to antidepressants, with fewer side effects. If you were to consider taking something for depression and your option was an antidepressant or St. John's wort, Cochrane is telling you it's probably going to work about the same with considerably fewer side effects. I, I think the, uh, the answer is pretty clear. And this is really important. The medications have side effects, right? So when people start taking them, you don't wake up one morning and feel a little bit depressed and go for a medication. Usually you've been suffering for quite a while. So here you are in a really low place. You've been there for quite a while. You go and get this prescription. You start taking it. And at first, usually you feel worse. And the side effects are really harsh, right? And so a big number of people will just stop the drug. So you were feeling really horrible when you started it. The side effects make you stop it. Now you're dealing with withdrawal from the drug plus how you were feeling before. It's a very horrifying situation you're far less likely to discontinue St. John's wort versus a prescription due to side effects. That's a huge, huge thing. Milk thistle, I throw this one little study in. I have a smile on my face when I say this. this is a small little study that shows something really interesting. It's very hard to treat OCD. We can talk about depression, anxiety, insomnia. OCD is very difficult. And this one little study showed milk thistle very powerfully helping OCD. And I've used this a handful of times in practice for OCD, and I've actually seen it work quite well. So I throw that in as a little food for thought, milk thistle helping OCD. I promised we'd talk about CAVA. You want to find one that is standardized to CAVA lactone. It has to be. And you want to be taking 120 milligram of CAVA lactone twice per day. That's the, that's the dose. Specifically, more effective for anxiety than mood. It can improve mood, but more effective for anxiety. And this is very important. Anything that can help anxiety or sleep has the potential to impair driving. So they actually did a specific human study with CAVA, giving a very high dose of CAVA, and then putting people in front of one of the driving simulators and showing that CAVA in no way impaired driving ability. That's a really, really key thing. So again, I give you a list, lots, it's not one or two, it's multiple human studies showing that CAVA can be very effective for treating anxiety. And I think I pretty much wrap up here with uh, N-acetylcysteine. <coughs> Forgive me, this dose is incorrect. This is too high. You wanna take 600 milligrams twice a day. So the appropriate dose of N-acetylcysteine is 600 milligrams twice a day. What impresses me about N-acetylcysteine, yes, it has the evidence that it helps depression, but the far more severe mental health things to help are bipolar, schizophrenia, OCD. These are very difficult. Drug withdrawal, very difficult. N-acetylcysteine has evidence of helping all of these. Trichotillomania means an obsession that you pull your own hair out, gambling addiction, very hard to treat, chronic nail biting, all of these things, very hard to treat, cocaine withdrawal, and acetylcysteine has been shown to help all of these, and that's why I'm happy to put it in this presentation. We're not going to dive into specific studies. Excuse me. Again, we're just giving, it's an endless list. 
Um, N-acetylcysteine in the world of mental health probably has at least 70 or 80 human studies. And I think I show you maybe a grand total of 20. And look at some of the stuff it's being looked for. Again, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, um, schizophrenia, schizophrenia, like these are so hard things to treat. Bipolar, chronic nail biting, trichotillomania, as we said, schizophrenia, um, straightforward depression, if there's anything straightforward about depression, and on and on and on. The list is simply endless. So guys, I think that is pretty much, and this list is just very long. That is it for me. I finish it with the summary slide. I truly thank each and every one of you for attending. It was grateful to have you on board. I got a question. One question came in. You noticed the major results, Ciprolex. Um, okay, thank you for the question, sir. You noticed benefit with Ciprolex. It's a very common antidepressant. You haven't been taking it too long. Should I be taking something else to help go off of them? Um, if you're thinking of going off of it, I would definitely, thank you for the question, I would definitely seek some advice. I wouldn't just do that on my own. Um, coming off of them should be done very, very, very slowly. And I would strongly consider adding uh, the first line stuff, the high EPA fish oil, the vitamin D, and the B complex adding that to it and I think you'll find that adding this to it works better than simply the medication alone. Do that for a while. I would I would keep taking Ciprolex 10 milligram. Um, I would add these things to it. Then after two or three months of adding these things to it, I would go talk to whoever prescribed my Ciprolex and I would say, okay, I'm feeling great. I'm taking some other basic stuff with it. I would now like to cons like to discuss with you lowering the Ciprolex from 10 milligrams, not to zero, to five. And then I would see how that goes. And I would do that for several months. And then I wouldn't go from five to zero. I would go from five to 2.5. So coming off an antidepressant needs to be done very slowly. I'm very happy to hear you've had a good response to Ciprolex that can certainly help. Um, adding these things will help a lot more. And then Consider, certainly discuss it with whoever prescribed the drug. Don't just do it on your own. Uh, reducing the dose by half. That would be the appropriate first step. Um, so thank you for the question. We got a couple more here. Which medication cannot be taken with St. John's wort? Thank you for the question, Kurt. Literally all of them. St. John's wort is the worst. It does not play well with drugs. Um, if you have an unmedicated individual on any type of drug, St. John's Wort is brilliant. If you're on a prescription even for blood pressure, you should be avoiding St. John's Wort. Anything for heart disease, you should be avoiding St. John's Wort. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, what do you recommend for those who have fish allergy for a substitute for fish oil? Thank you for the question, but sadly, for the time being, there is no acceptable substitute. Plant oils like flax or canola do not deliver EPA. Algae oil is interesting, but I really stressed it has to be high EPA, high EPA, high EPA. To my knowledge, that yet doesn't exist for algae. It will eventually, but algae started as pure DHA. You wouldn't want to do that. Then they had algae with DHA and a little EPA. Slowly, the EPA in algae products is increasing. I'm waiting till they make an algae product with high EPA. To my knowledge, it doesn't exist yet, but thank you for the question. Um, lavender, in a public seminar, I like obligated, and it's not just saying that, there's reasons. Like You need to be careful combining these things with medications. I would say that's something you have to consult a healthcare provider about. I would not recommend uh, just, you know, over the counter to the public adding lavender to any prescription. In a clinical setting, if you're seeing a naturopath, uh, it's literally going through every specific drug. I can't name you a class. It'd be like, okay, there's five or six antidepressants we would combine lavender with. There's seven or eight we would not.
and you really have to go through it on a prescription by prescription basis on a patient by patient basis so forgive me but <coughs> excuse me there's really no blanket statement you can make about lavender and drugs those are very good questions oh we got another one please keep them coming guys we love the questions uh ruby thank you for sharing um thank you for attending the webinar i don't know where home is for you if bolton is anywhere close to you please reach out to our office um we are the bolton naturopathic clinic if you just google that you'll find us right away um i i'd love to be able to reach out for you to you with some help i can't on a webinar treat you that's highly, highly illegal, but we would love to reach out to you, make you a patient of the facility, and I'm confident we can help. And I'm afraid that's the best I can do. We've given some very good entry-level advice here. Um, um, thank you for attending. Thank you for being here tonight. Don't give up hope. There are things that can really help. You just have to find the right people to help. And I wish you much, much, much success for that. Um, thank you for sharing. Any other questions out there, people? It's an area we love working in. There's all sorts of magnitudes from the mild to the moderate to the very severe. There are things that can really help no matter what severity of illness people might be experiencing. Um, the information you got today is very accurate, I guarantee you. We use it every day in practice. Some of the more advanced stuff really does need some physician or some, you know, some supervision from a qualified healthcare provider. And I'd really encourage people to seek that type of help. Um, but certainly on your own, there are some very straightforward yet ultra effective things that can be done. You're on a prescription, you add these basics, high EPA fish oil, vitamin D, uh, B complex or a good multi, and the, the difference is not subtle. It's very obvious, it takes a bit of time to kick in, be patient, and I think you'll be very, very impressed with how things go. Guys, I think that's it. I don't see any other questions. I really do appreciate, again, on behalf of both Vitamart and New Roots Herbal, uh, we appreciate your attendance. I'm grateful to both of them for allowing me to be here with you tonight. Um, keep your eyes peeled. We may likely be doing other webinars um, through this platform again. And I wish all of you all the success in the world and a very, very good evening and good luck.